the next 30 minutes could change your life. I want to welcome you to Redemption with Ron Carpenter, and I get to be the guy. I get to be Ron Carpenter. Thank you so much for coming and being with us today. We are excited about what God wants to do in your life. We know that whenever God does something, He starts it with a seed. We know Jesus was a seed that went into the earth and became many sons. We know that His Word is seed and can reproduce 30, 60, 100 fold. We know that our giving can be seed. God loves to use seed. You are about to have seed deposited into your life. Do you have any idea the potential of what you're about to hear whenever you're hearing the Word of God? Well, I don't want to jump through the camera and preach there, but you can tell I get excited about dedicating my life to this book called the Bible, and I get to teach it and preach it to wonderful people like you. I want you to hang in here with me because we're about to redefine some things and what we understand about grace and the original intent of God in sending His Son. I believe this, is, this can blow your mind when you see the ultimate end that God was really trying to bring about. It ain't just trying to about fill up a church or get people to heaven. It's about so much more. Don't go away. Psalm chapter 8. Oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is that. Don't you, that, that just make, let's say that together. How excellent is your name in all the earth. Whew. Mm, good God. Mm. Who have set your glory above the heavens and out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants. <coughs> Pardon me. You have ordained strength because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. Actually, that says that you have ordained praise. And praise silences your enemy and silences the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you would visit him? For you have made him a little lower. Those of you that haven't been here, you have to go back and get the message. Not than angels, the correct translation is Jehovah. The translators actually, they did a great job. I wouldn't want to have to translate the Bible, but they dumbed that word down because of its implications. The implications of being made a little less than Jehovah is vastly different than being made a little less than an angel. Thou hast made him a little less than God himself. God, you made man right under you. This is how we know. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet. See, you think all things were supposed to be under his feet. No, they're supposed to be under your feet too. Because he's the head and you're the body. So if it's going to be under his feet, that means it's under your feet. Because the body makes up the feet. I'm preaching real good right now. You put all things under his feet. All sheep, oxen, beasts of the field, birds of the air, fish of the sea. And that pass through the paths of the sea. Oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. And flip to Hebrews 2 very quickly. Hebrews chapter 2, I've read this one a couple of times, and I want to read it one more time. And as much then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, Jesus, likewise shared in the same. And that he brought death that he might destroy him who had the, verse 15, power of death. That is the devil. Did you catch that? Jesus tasted death to destroy him that had the power of it. You know what it makes me want to do? It makes me want to go, ow! <laughs> the power of it. Next verse, verse 15. And release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Oh my gosh. Because the devil held the power of it. Everybody under the devil was subject to a lifetime of bondage 
till God did something about it. But he destroyed the one who had the power and released those who were under the power. Did you catch that? He destroyed the devil who had the power of death. And when he destroyed him, he went down and released all those that were under the bondage of it. Somebody say, that's me. That's me. That's me. Okay. Now go back, Hebrews 2, go back to verse 8. Verse 8. Hebrews 2, verse 8. I don't want to read this right here. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all things in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. Now, this is a very interesting statement. But now, somebody say now. We do not, verse 9, yet see all things put under him. We don't see it. It is... I just don't see it. Remember, there is a world you can't see. And in that world that you can't see, everything that God has done already is. You got to get this concept. Let your mind wrap around. In the spirit world, God is finished. When you pray and you got a migraine, Jesus doesn't get up and run around heaven frantically saying, what am I going to do? Jesus does not get frustrated. In fact, there's only one thing in the Bible that I ever saw made Jesus stand up because the Bible says he is forever seated. The only time I saw Jesus stand up is when Stephen was getting stoned. So when you can take your persecution and praise him anyway, he'll stand up. (laughs) Hallelujah. When them blocks of life are hitting you and you still praising, that'll make Jesus stand up. He said, I saw the Son of Man standing up and the heavens were open. Some of you that can take what you're going through and praise him anyhow, if you want to see Jesus stand up, that's the only thing that I know will make him stand up. Hey, somebody touch your neighbor and say, praise him right now. Come on, five seconds. Let the hurting shout one time. Let, Let the persecuted shout one time. Let those that have had a bad week shout hallelujah. Okay. That'll make him stand up. Woo. I just threw that out there. That's free. That ain't in my notes. So everything in heaven is finished. Jesus said on the cross it's finished. Your problem does not put him back to work. He's already finished your problem. Well, pastor, I've been so sick. He's finished your healing. I am so messed up and addicted. He's finished your deliverance. Now we have to take something and move it from one dimension to another dimension. Notice he said everything has been put under his feet. There is nothing about the work of Jesus that was left undone or that you need to add to. It is finished. And everything has been put under his feet. But we have to take what is in the spirit and move it into a reality in our present life. That's why he said we take these things and make them a matter of prayer. Pray in this manner. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it already. It already is. It is in heaven and it needs to be on earth. So he has not left anything that is not put under him, although we do not yet see it. We don't see it. It's not visible. All the conditions of my life do not reflect the fact that everything has been put under my feet. When Jesus did his work for me and I received his work, as my savior, as my salvation, as my righteousness, when I received what he did for me in the spirit realm, there is nothing that I do not have dominion over. I got your attention, whether you believe me or not, you are listening. 
But what do I have to do? There is a process of unlocking doors and using keys to the kingdom that allow it to come in my personal life. Okay? We're going to study a little bit of that right now. This is where I ended last week. I ended with a diagram, very pitiful diagram. I don't know why God's got me using visuals because I am the least artistic person that I know. I can't hardly draw a stick man without leaving him with one arm off. I mean, I'm, I, have a, I struggle artistically, but... I drew the diagram and I told you when God created the heavens and the earth, he created Adam a little lower than himself and gave him dominion over all the works of his hands. You had Satan that was once an angel leading worship in heaven and then out of his pride and out of his rebellion, he was cast out of heaven. And the next time we see him, he's not in heaven with God. He's in the Garden of Eden and is taken on another form. You got to listen to Wednesday night to hear about how he can move in and out of one dimension into another. Oh, that was a good Wednesday night. Hallelujah. Okay. Now, the Bible says that his main iniquity, his great iniquity is his trafficking. Ezekiel 28. In other words, while Satan worked for God, he learned how heaven and earth operate together and how earth was meant to reflect heaven, how Adam was created to reflect God and how Adam was made to operate like God operates and how the garden was made perfect because it operated out of the same laws of heaven that was perfect. And then after Satan learned how to run the system, he showed up in another dimension in the garden in physical form as a serpent. He learned how to move in and out of earth and heaven. Church folks still don't know how to do that. We don't know how to access heavens, so we have gimmicks and games and programs. I'm preaching real good. It's quiet in here. There are heavens that you can access. Even all the way back to Jacob. Jacob said he had a vision. He saw angels ascending and descending. We know Enoch got so far in the spirit that one day he never came back. He levitated and just went on up. How many of you like right in the middle of your problem sometimes just go right on up? Yeah, I, I've, I've been there too. Hallelujah. Lord, take me now. We know that these things happen. We know that Philip dematerialized in one area and materialized in a whole nother town. Oh, I'd like to do that when it's vacation time and I'm going to the beach. Just right out of Greenville, just end up somewhere else. Hallelujah. And we turn all of these things over to the demonic. You only see that in a demon-filled movie. You only see that in a horror story. But these, these, these stories did not originate out of the demonic. They originated out of people who learned how to access the heavens and move back and forth as God let, literally allowed them to enjoy his atmosphere. But now you start talking about the supernatural in church. People think you're a crazy preacher and don't want to go to that church. We just want a good children's program and we want a nice building come on and we want the latest technology and we want to be out in 60 minutes and if any if we start talking about anybody getting healed or a demon getting cast out or come up here and throw your drug paraphernalia on the altar God's going to set you free today church people get nervous Hollywood ain't nervous about spiritual activity why is the church so nervous about it the fact is, I'd like to see God do something in church one time. I'm tired of going to church all the time and don't see nothing but people. I'd like to go to church and see God. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now look, I got more to say. You know, a preacher can always say something, all right? So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Here in America, we are being fed a steady diet of loose boundaries and disrespect through the many media outlets available to us today. Ron Carpenter has designed his new series, How to Change Your Life in 10 Days, to help counter a culture of dishonor and gives you keys to a total turnaround in your life. Whatever you honor is drawn towards you, and whatever you honor gives you the ability to access. Whatever you disrespect will move away from you, and whatever you disrespect, you will never have the ability to access. 
Receive all 10 messages from How to Change Your Life in 10 Days on CD for your ministry gift of just $50 or on DVD for just $75 or more. Call, write, or visit roncarpenter.com to order this powerful series. These 10 messages will speak into your life with a level of impact like no other series has ever done before. Change your life in 10 days. Start today. And now, back to Redemption with Ron Carpenter. Satan got Adam to rebel, and then you had God, you had Satan, who the Bible said was the prince of the air and the god of this world, who was supposed to be the god of this world. Ephesians refers now to Satan as the god of this world. Then you got angels. Then you got Adam. Not a fun place to be at the bottom of the totem pole. And instead of him having everything under his feet, everybody's got their feet on him. Because the Bible says in Romans in 3.23, all have sinned and not lost faith, not lost blood, not lost anointing, not lost, we all lost the glory. The glory. You've given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have crowned him with glory and honor. You allowed Adam to function in the earth, oh God, like you function in heaven, to run it all. And when Adam sinned, he lost the ability to run it all. And somebody else got the ability to run it all. So Satan was then named the God of this world because of sin. He got Adam to vacate his place. I'm trying to get you to see the picture of salvation was never just to get you a ticket to heaven. The picture of salvation is that God created a heaven and he created an earth and he intends on regaining the earth. Oh, God. He intends on regaining the earth and he's not going to come himself and do it. He sent you and he gave you the glory back. And when you accept Jesus, the Bible says that Jesus became the son of God. And Hebrews 2 said that he reached down and brought many sons to glory. Jesus' whole idea was to put you back in charge of your world, to put you back in charge of your atmosphere, to put you back in charge of the affairs of your life, put you back in charge of your mind, in charge of your thoughts, in charge of your feelings, in charge of your, come on, in charge of your passions, in charge of your money, in charge of your career, in charge of your business, in charge of your relationship. God no longer wants us to walk around in chaos and disorder and dysfunction. You have been given the glory to put your life back in place. Is anybody here hearing what I am saying today? Shout hallelujah. Tap three people and say, I have control of this. I've got, I ain't talking about God's got control. You've got control. And for those who've ever had your life spin out of order, ain't that a good sound? Isn't that a, a sweet sound to know that you don't have to live that way anymore? Y'all making me sweat. Now, can I keep preaching? I got something I want to lay on you. It's going to sting a little bit. Can I do it anyway? Are you sure? This ain't just for Wednesday night. I can do it for Sunday. I'm looking at it and I'm, I'm hurting a little bit as I look at it. Because it sounded good when I was writing it, but now that I'm looking at all y'all, hallelujah. Somebody say, tell it. I'll tell it to you if you want me to tell it. This is where most people live. Let's just, let's, let's just be for real. This is a get real church. This is the way most people live. Because we don't understand the difference between position and condition. The Bible says that there is one thing that defines my reality. You're going to be very surprised I'm going to rock your religious boat. The Bible does not say that Jesus defines my reality. The Bible says my thinking defines my reality. 
What I have noticed in this generation is when you come to God, there's a twofold thing that's supposed to take place in your mind. There's supposed to be an uprooting of what you have previously believed. <clears throat> and then there's supposed to be a replanting of the seed of God, which is his word, in your mind and in your heart. What I have learned is we are trying to take what we hear from the preacher and hear from the teacher and in our Bible study. What we're doing is we're taking what we are learning and adding it to what we already know. And that creates mixture. I don't have time to go here. That is why lifestyles are so schizophrenic. That is why I can read Facebook and they're saying, my pastor just said that the difficulty of your present time is an indicator of the greatness of your tomorrow. And then the next thing I'll read, they posted. How did we move from one to the other so quickly? It's because you heard what I said, but you ain't uprooted what you've heard everybody else say. That's why we come to church with a hangover. Because our Saturday night is so, okay, don't look down, don't look down, look at me, look at me. Because our Saturday night is so different from our Sunday. For somebody to preach it like this. It ain't that you're not getting the word of God. It's that you're adding it on to everything you already know. And so you have two acceptable lifestyles operating parallel. But what you don't know is they are contradicting one another. I hope that you've enjoyed this teaching because you know what, there's a whole lot more to come. This is one of those teachings when you begin digging in this well, uh, it seems like there's no end to the wealth of revelation and information that God has on this subject. And it really redefines the position that you take with God and in the earth as you're here when you realize that God was trying to raise you up to do the works of Christ himself in the earth. Wow, what a powerful responsibility we have. Just want to tell you how much I appreciate you how much I thank you uh, for giving us this privilege. This is a privilege to be able to serve you in this way. Uh, it takes a lot of people doing a lot of things to be able to bring this to you and they've devoted their life to it. I've devoted my life to it because we believe that we have a cause and we have a message that is powerful enough to lay down your life for it. Would you help me? I wanna tell all of you that have been supporting us for weeks, months, years, no matter how long, I give you a great big thank you. And I wish I could touch. I wish I could come to your home and break bread. I wish I could visit. But when your audience is expanded all over the whole world, it's very difficult to do that. So you have to feel the expression of my heart through this television lens. I thank you so much for partnering with us and for everything you've done. But for those of you who may have never given, and those of you who may be out there and you say, I've never even really thought about supporting a ministry. Uh, this doesn't just happen. It takes a lot of people with expertise, people of lifestyle training, people with gifts, equipment. It takes TV time. It takes satellites circling the earth. It takes a lot to get this to you. Would you help us do what we do? Would you get on board? Would you be a co become a covenant partner with us? I have a gift I want to give you. I want you to consider becoming a covenant partner. And for your first month's gift of any amount, I'm going to leave that between you and God. It's not a specific amount we're asking for because we know that people have different levels of ability to give. So whatever God puts in your heart, I have a gift I wanna send you back. I wanna be a giver too. And I wanna give you this DVD on self-control because I believe that we're dealing with a generation more than ever before that needs to learn God's ways to take passions that work against them and rein those things in so that we don't lead ourselves to destruction because Jesus himself said there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is destruction. He said, actually narrow is the way. You can walk in that narrow way. I want this DVD called Self-Control to be yours. 
thank you for all you do and for those that would like to join this family of believers in supporting redemption with Ron Carpenter. Thank you for becoming a part of this family. We look forward to connecting with you on an ongoing basis. You know, I want to be able to share some of the things that people are saying back to us. You have to sit there and listen to me. I want you to know that people correspond back. I would love for our relationship not just to be me preaching and be a monologue, but be a dialogue. We get to hear what God's doing in your life. Here's some of the tweets that we have. You know, Karen Mundy from Charlotte, she says, one of the most difficult things you'll ever do is see yourself properly. Also, we have Robbie Batchelor from Alabama. He said, my potential is unoccupied territory and I have to renew my mind to arrive. Praise God, I like that. We have Jay Dangum, a fight will force you to focus but don't lose focus once the battle is over. That's right, I taught against, be careful that you rel don't relax too much once you've seen the fruitfulness of your battle through to the other side. Also, we have Chavis Holmes, adversity passes quickly, but rewards are forever. Wonderful, wonderful word. Karen Melissa Shaw, just because you're blessed doesn't mean that your days aren't bad, but it means the bad days can't hold you. You're exactly right. Listen, there's so many people out there by the hundreds of thousands that are now connecting with us through TV. We want you to connect with, we want to deepen the quality of our relationship. We have so many other things we offer you. Go to Pastor Ron Carpenter, the YouTube channel. Go to our website where all these messages are in their full length on demand at rwc.org. Go to my Pastor Ron Carpenter, Facebook and Twitter. So many things where you can deepen the quality of this connection and relationship. We want to serve you better and we're doing all we can to connect with you in the best and most efficient way that we can. I believe God's doing something in this world that is powerful and he's going to use the power of connection to bring it to pass. Would you connect with us? Check out all these things I've just told you and I'm believing that next week's going to be better than this week. Tomorrow's going to be better than today because your God always exceeds himself and I'll see you again real soon. Mm -hmm.